I want to take that as my text this morning from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 21, verses 15 through 22. If you have your Bible handy or New Testament, I want to invite you to turn there. Matthew, the very first uh, book in the New Testament, chapter 15, uh, excuse me, chapter 22 and beginning at verse 15. And this morning I want to talk about giving ourselves to God, <laughs> giving ourselves to God. Uh, more often than not, when we think about our relationship with God, we think of God as the giver and uh, ourselves as the receiver. Uh, God gives uh, and we take. Now, that, of course, is uh, absolutely true that uh, God is a giver. In fact, that's the message of the Bible. Uh, and uh, what? The message of the most famous verse in the Bible, that God is a giver. You know the most famous uh, verse in the Bible? John 3.16. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only son, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so absolutely, God is a giver. But it'd be pretty hard to say that we're in a relationship with God as God if God is always the giver and we're always the receiver. At, at least uh, uh, none of us would call that a, a relationship uh, in the case of two human beings, uh, indeed, if you had a relationship with someone, a relationship so-called, uh, and you did all the giving and the other person did all of the taking, uh, you probably wouldn't call that uh, a relationship. Uh, indeed, a, a relationship is reciprocal. Uh, and uh, what God wants from us, uh, if we would be in, in relationship with him, is God wants us to give in return. He wants us to love him in, in return. He wants uh, to uh, give himself to us, and he wants us to give ourselves to him in return. Uh, and, and in a not so subtle way, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about uh, here in our text this morning. Now, uh, what's described in the text uh, happened during Jesus's last week uh, before his death by crucifixion and his uh, subsequent resurrection three days later. Uh, uh, he is in Jerusalem. Uh, he's teaching every day in the temple. Uh, he's t it's a very, uh, uh, a very hostile uh, situation, very intense. Uh, he's uh, on many occasions in his teaching at the temple, taking on uh, the religious establishment there, criticizing them, telling parables against them, and they're not liking it at all. Uh, indeed, they're wanting to arrest him, and yet they have to be careful because of the people uh, and uh, the, what the people think about Jesus and how they might respond to them taking such action. In fact, if you back up to the, to the uh, previous chapter in the last two verses of that chapter, uh, Matthew 21 and verses 45 and 46, you'll notice where Matthew writes, And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parables that, that Jesus was uh, teaching, and perceived that he was speaking about them, and in particular, he was speaking against them. Verse 46, uh, that they wanted to uh, arrest him, and yet they feared the crowds, because the people, the crowds, held Jesus to be a prophet. And then we come to this morning's text, and we read that again, the Pharisees are up to it again. <laughs> we read in verse 15, and the Pharisees went and plotted how they might be able to entangle Jesus in his own words. Indeed, uh, getting rid of Jesus directly by arrest or taking him by force or doing other, some other such thing, uh, had to, they, they dawned on them that that was not an option for them, at least not for now. And so the Pharisees, that, uh, th uh, that is the members of the religious establishment, uh, sent some of their students, what we might think of today as the seminary students, uh, students in religion, uh, and they, they plotted amongst themselves uh, how to uh, come up uh, with a plan that to, to get Jesus perhaps uh, to condemn himself. Uh, and, and so we read in verse 16, and it says, And the Pharisees sent some of their disciples, that is, these students of theirs, along with the Herodians. Uh, so students of the Pharisees. Uh, which might have seemed a, a, a lesser threat, and that might have been part of the plot. Well, let's not go to him ourselves in our, our uh, grand robes and so forth, which they wore all the time every day, just so everybody would know who they were. 
and, and render them the proper respect. But let's send along our, our students. Uh, and, and then, uh, th and this is a, a rather strange turn, and su some uh, supporters of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Herod regime uh, to further throw Jesus off, perhaps. Um, indeed, the Pharisees and the Herodians uh, were well-known enemies of one another. They came from two different religious and political perspectives. Uh, they, they, they were well-known enemies. Uh, the, the, the Pharisees were, uh, as we know historically, by and large, nationalists. They hated the Romans who were occupying their, uh, their uh, country uh, by force and enforcing martial law and taxing the Jews. Uh, and certainly it was taxation without representation uh, and often abusing the Jews. And then, and then there were the Herodians, uh, Herod's supporters, and they were collaborators with the Romans. Indeed, the, 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 the Herods ruled in Palestine at the pleasure of the Romans and did the Romans bidding oftentimes. Uh, indeed, uh, one might uh, uh, wonder uh, how this all came about, but to perhaps... Uh, they were able to agree and come together uh, based upon that uh, age-old adage that my uh, enemy's enemy is my friend. And so they hated Jesus and the prospects of what might happen if he w continued the way he was uh, carrying on. And so while they hated each other, uh, they both hated uh, Jesus more. And so they came together on this plot. Uh, to get Jesus to condemn himself and end, end his influence uh, with his own words. And so they came together and they said uh, to Jesus, uh, Teacher, we know <laughs> that you're true and that you teach the way of God truthfully and that you don't care about anyone's opinion and that you're not swayed by appearance. And, of course, all of these things were true. Jesus certainly was all of these things. He, he, was, he was true. He was uh, faithful to God. He was a man of integrity. He was no respecter of persons. In fact, over and over in the Old Testament and the New, we're told that God is no respecter of persons. And, then, and we're told uh, to imitate that, to do what's good and right, regardless of how the chips may uh, fall. Uh, and Jesus was that kind of person. He told the truth at all times, whether people appreciated it or not, and regardless of the consequences. But this was all a ploy, not even flattery, I would say, but a ploy to, to, to throw Jesus off of his game uh, and to get Jesus to say something that would, uh, on the one hand, uh, discredit himself uh, with the nationalists, the Pharisees and others, what we might think of really the Jews in general. Uh, who uh, who hated the Romans uh, and their presence in their country and their abuse and their taxes, or or on the other hand, uh, and this was the, they thought was part of their ingenious plot uh, to get Jesus uh, on the other hand to say something that would uh, perhaps uh, put him at odds with the Herodians, uh, who would if Jesus had said anything against taxation and against the Romans, uh, would report him to the Romans. Uh, and you know how that would go. And this was the question that they put to Jesus. Well, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pray, uh, pay taxes to Caesar or to the Romans or not? Now, as we've already said, if Jesus said, uh, yes, uh, it's right to pay taxes to Caesar, most of the people, the Jews, uh, would no longer have listened to him and his influence uh, would come to nothing. And with them, then the problem solved. Or if he, on the other hand, should say, no, it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar, then he would no doubt to be arrested by the Romans and dealt with accordingly. And then, of course, the problem, as they saw it, would be solved. But as we see in our text, Jesus was, Jesus was on to them. Indeed, notice again in verse 18, but Jesus, aware of their malice, that is, their ill intent, uh, their, their wish to do him harm, said to them, why do you put me to, to the test, you hypocrites? <laughs> the, the word hypocrites comes from the Greek. It literally means to wear a mask. Uh, they were being hypocrites. They, they, were, they didn't really care what he knew or what he thought about anything. They were just trying to bring him down. Uh, but uh, Jesus says, uh, well, then uh, show me a coin. Uh, show me the coin with which we, we pay the tax. 
I thought it was sort of interesting. Jesus didn't have any money on him. <laughs> he had to ask for a coin. But he said, show me a coin. And so they brought him a denarius. Now, the, the denarius was a, a, was a, a silver coin, a Roman issue uh, that was used. In fact, it was required uh, when paying uh, the Roman tax. And Jesus uh, took the coin uh, and he showed it to them. And, of course, they would have been familiar with it anyway. And he said, and so uh, whose likeness and inscription is on the coin? And they all said Caesar's. Indeed, stamped on the coin, the coin that would have been in use at Jesus's time uh, was uh, stamped with the profile, that is the face and head of Tiberius Caesar, and then was added this inscription, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And so then Jesus said to, to them, well, then render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. Jesus is saying, well, the, the coin has Caesar's image on it. In fact, the Greek word is icon, his image and his name on it. Uh, so give him his coin, is what Jesus is saying. And then Jesus adds something that has nothing to do with what they asked. In fact, it, uh, it goes beyond what they asked. And Jesus adds and give to God what belongs to God. Well, what's Jesus saying? Well, oh, Jesus said that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it's uh, give Caesar his coin uh, because his image is on it. His image is on it. It belongs to him. And then Jesus uh, says, uh, and give to God what belongs to God. Well, how do we know what belongs to God? Well, the thing that belongs to God is the thing on which his image is. And so what bears God's image? Well, it's you and I who are created in his image and likeness. The coin bears Caesar's image, and you and I bear God's image. And then finally, Jesus says, or the text says, Matthew's comments, he says, and when they heard this, uh, they marveled and they left him and went away. <laughs> well, of course they did. <laughs> the way in which Jesus answered wasn't anything that they were expecting. And he silenced them. But let's not uh, miss the point. Not the point that the Pharisees and the Herodians raise about taxes and the coin and the money and Caesar and the Romans and all of that. But the point that Jesus raises, that we bear God's image that we belong to God. And Jesus says, and therefore uh, we ought to give ourselves to God because we belong to God. We bear his image and not give him just part of ourselves, not just part of the coin. <laughs> you don't give to Caesar just uh, a part of the coin. You don't split the coin. You give Caesar all of the coin. And so not just part of ourselves, but the whole of ourselves. Give unto God what is God's, Jesus says. Give him everything. Give him your whole self. And of course, the apostles pick up on this later, uh, not least of which Paul, with his famous text from Romans 12 and uh, verses 1 and 2, uh, where he wrote, And I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. <laughs> he doesn't, we didn't say, well, just present your hand or your foot or part of your brain or part of your heart or part of yourself, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's a, a sacrifice, a, an act of worship uh, to God. It costs you something. Indeed, in the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant, uh, when they brought a sacrifice to God, they'd br bring a livestock or they'd bring grain or some other thing, depending on what sort of livelihood uh, they were engaged in. And it was costly. It cost them something. And then God said, too, and, and when you bring me a lamb or you uh, bring me an ox or you bring me a goat or whatever, don't bring me the one that's blind or the one that's lame and, it, and one of its legs. Or uh, the, What was required was uh, uh, the whole thing and, one, uh, and your best lamb, your best goat, your best livestock. 
So he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Of course it's acceptable to God. It's just what he wants, which is holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's not just some. Uh, it's not just self denial or a sacrifice in and of itself. It's an act of worship to live uh, in relationship with God in such a way. And then he says in verse two, and don't be conformed to this world. The world will take you away from such things. Don't be conformed or or, um, or poured into the world's mold and its way of thinking and its value system. Don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He wants the mind and the body, our whole self, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the what the will of the Lord is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In fact, when you when you when you surrender yourself in this way, God makes His will known to us, uh, and we find out that it's good and perfect, and everything He says that it is. So it's an extraordinary thing. I, and I suppose the question is, is this uh, how you would describe the, the life that you're pursuing with God? I know it's of interest to you. You wouldn't be watching this this morning and participating in this remote worship if it wasn't. But I think that's always the challenge, isn't it? Am I pursuing God in such a way? In fact, there isn't any other option. <laughs> Not with Jesus. I think we think that that's true. I think it's like uh, super Christian and non super Christian, and we kind of gra uh, grade ourselves on a on a on a on a, on a scale. Uh, but, but interesting, somebody has written with Jesus, the highest ideals and the minimum requirements of discipleship are one and the same. Is it, and that's exactly true. Have you read the New Testament? Jesus talks to everybody the same, and the standard and the thing to which he calls. Anyone, he calls everyone. Listen to what, what, what the, the writer said again. With Jesus, the highest ideals and the minimum requirement with, of discipleship is one and the same. And so with Jesus, it's all or nothing at all, which I think actually is a good thing. But it might seem uh, a bad thing or something that you might want to avoid, but I think actually it's a good thing. Someone else has written, uh, we cannot give God half of our heart and expect the whole of our heart to be satisfied. And I, and I think that's rather telling. We can't give God half of our heart and expect the whole of our heart to be satisfied. And if you're not feeling satisfied right now and you're not satisfied with your Christian life, uh, that's probably just it. Because he only has half of your heart or even less rather than all of your heart. Or that you're in the pursuit of that, saying yes to that and then doing everything that you can. Not having to leave your job or leave your family or go and live in a monastery or some other such thing like that, but committing to him. And so that that commitment begins to affect uh, everything and every part and way of your life. Hmm. Of course, this kind of commitment can be scary. I expect there's some of you right now that this is making you feel uncomfortable and maybe scaring you uh, a bit. In fact, John Burke in his uh, book, Soul Revolution, he wrote this. He said, over the years, I've learned that to really benefit from God's plan, I have to be willing to give up my own. <laughs> and he says, and this is scary at times. I appreciate the honesty. In fact, uh, without honesty, we don't ever make any progress. And so we need to identify that. And yet, scary or not, that's exactly what Jesus is calling us to this morning. To complete commitment. And I wonder, can you hear Jesus calling you this morning? Someone said, if you want something that you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done and do it. <laughs> Not just willing, but do it. If you want something that you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done and do it, giving ourselves to God. Let us pray. I, I know, Lord, uh, that there are people that you love that are hearing this even now. 
And, and they've heard things like this many times before, perhaps. Uh, and uh, maybe they feel ashamed or they feel uh, some other thing. And then when all of that passes, they're right back where they, where they started. And no progress is made. And, and, and the fullness of joy is, is never tapped into. And so I, I pray that you would help me and help everyone who's hearing this to make that decision right now and say, yes, Lord, not maybe, Lord, or I'll think about it, Lord, or I'm not worthy, Lord, or some other whatever we do uh, to, to deflect the call. Help us to answer the call, even today on the 18th of October, not to wait one more moment, but even before we get to the amen of this prayer, to say in our heart, Lord, I, I, I'm going to go in a completely do, new direction. I'm not just going to be a church goer or just be a, an interested bystander and from the periphery listen in or say, well, that's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to get out of the stands and onto the field and play the game to your glory. Help us to do it right now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.